The final item of business today is the Members' Business Debate on Motion No. 13199 in the name of Chick Brodie on Youth Football's contribution to men's and women's football. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would be grateful if those members who wish to contribute could press the request to speak buttons now, please. I call on Chick Brodie to open the debate. Seven minutes, please, Mr Brodie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, it is normal practice in Members' debates to say that one is delighted even privileged to bring such a debate to the Chamber. Tonight, against the maelstrom of this week's international criticism of global football management, I am not so determined or indeed delighted, but I do wish to thank Amado Fraser and James Kelly for supporting the de debate, for I know of their personal interest in the game and their inherent personal fairness. Presiding officer in life, we have many dreams. To achieve a personal desire and aspiration is inspiring. And as we sit here to, if not to make, certainly to hope to achieve just one significant change that may affect positively just one person's life and that of a child. To do so is humbling. And that's what I hope we will affect tonight, to start to eschew and stop the exploitation of children's dreams. To start to make, again, football our beautiful game. Beautiful again because it has in this area, in my opinion, turned ugly. And let me, before I do so, thank those who for very many years have kept that dream alive, that flame burning, to Willie Smith and Scott Robertson of the Rio Grassroots Organisation who are with us tonight, to their consultants and advisors, to the fantastic European Youth Football Advisors in FIFPRO and other national professional advisors and consultants I've been privileged to meet. Let me say thanks. And also thanks to Scotland's Children and Young People's uh, Commissioner Organisation that has conducted its recent review of this subject purposefully, professionally and independently. Behind the great wall of support for football, of total and unwavering faith in our local and national teams, there lies a very dark corner as to why our ultimate goal and the progress toward it will be limited in our inability to be a natural producer again of our national and inherent football skills. This too is increasingly important as young women embrace our national game. So, presiding officer, in challenging the normal modus of members' debates tonight and going forward, we seek answers and we seek change. Let's start first with the, the cherry picking by some clubs of potentially talented young footballers. Children, some as six years old, but more generally 10 and 12 years old, and only but with, with one thought in their mind, one place in their mind. It could be Celtic Park, Ibrox, the Bernabeu, Old Trafford, or even their own local professional park, only to be cast aside a few years later, not good enough, and then their dreams turn into nightmares. Except for the few, the very few, the 15 and 16 year olds with huge ability, with even greater skills, but to some with greater investment potential. These young people, engaged and over enthused in some cases by parents, to engage in, engage in contracts or registration forms with some of our clubs, and these are documents that are not worth the paper they are written on. Contracts, registration forms, now apparently commitment letters in some cases which do not meet UK or European legislative standards. When meeting our National Skills Agency to talk of professional apprenticeships in football, I was told the registration forms for young people in football today were indeed worthless and they were considering its continued financial support. The contracts, the registration forms were exercises aimed at the dreams of the young and their parents. It cannot, for example, be right, cannot be right to deny an 18-year-old so contracted to be denied to play for his university, for example, because of an alleged contract which is now the basis of challenge. But, presiding officer, it is not only that basis of legality of those arrangements we challenge. For example, I have become aware, and as a result of pursuing correspondence, I have detailed information from BIS and the HMRC and tax people to support it that there have been professional football clubs in Scotland contracting, contracting and paying young players on less than the minimum wage in contravention of the National Minimum Wage Act of 1998. 
This announcement, of course, will have much wider implications elsewhere. But there are, play there are players being contracted to a club paying him one time one pounds per week, and in fact paying anyone less than the minimum wage is in fact in contravention of that act and that the contract of registration does not apply. This is a very serious but confirmed legal inter interpretation and, as I say, has much wider implications indeed outside football. The additional restriction under the Human Rights Act of personal freedom of movement without appropriate transfer rights is frankly and also a major breach of civil rights under European law. And remember, remember we're talking of children. Frankly, presiding officer, I lay this primarily, primarily at the door of our major football club organisation in its subservience to the clubs and apparent lack of monitoring of those clubs and its seeming total disengagement with this parliament and with its organisations. In a letter to me of the 29th of January this year, when I asked the SPFL, for it is they, about its engagement with the consultation being prepared by the Children's Commissioner on specifically the minimum wage, it said it was unaware of the wider consultation. Well, it should have been. It should have been. And based on the data I've received from SPICE, the Footballing Authority agreed to deliver an integrated and four-year cycle plan, an investment plan. And in the course of that, Sport Scotland invested over the period 2011 to 2015 five and a half million pounds. And that, that included a network development centre to support the best young grassroots player. And in seeking to determine the return on that investment, we shall seek to have, and I shall seek to have, an audit trail of that expenditure, some of which I accept will be bona fide. Presiding officer, many questions, many questions arise, not least are we following the robust guidance of FIFPRO, UEFA and the football trade unions? And will we now listen to the wise words of the valued commissioner, where the report commendably headlined said, I quote, I would like to have control over my life and do what I want to do. Or do we sit back and allow the directors and the agents to whose actions we shall turn to in the future, to treat children, as the commissioner said in 2011, as commodities, Commodity is now subject to financial raids from clubs south of the border. An attitudinal change in youth football in Scotland is now required. Presiding officer, finally, Dickensian, Dickensian we are no longer. And children's rights will be protected, and there should be, will be, no circumstance where the state or associated bodies should invest resources or finance that violates those rights. Those involved, I repeat, are children. Not investments not commodities. They too have rights. Football in Scotland shall now return to its roots, belonging to its fans, to our young footballers and to our collective dream. If the current administrators of Scottish foot club football and by default Scottish youth football cannot make themselves the required uh, changes to meet these rights, then we shall seek to pursue a statutory course and underpin current legislation that does so. We will not, we will not wait a further five years to do so. Thank you. Thank you. This is a popular debate. Could I ask members to keep two four-minute speeches, please? And I call Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Kenny McCaskill. So I congratulate Chick Brodie on bringing forward this important motion. And like him, I want to start with the football for those aspiring to play in the top bracket. But I think the motion invites us also to consider for a much, football for a much wider range uh, of young people. Now, it's very timely, of course, given the uh, Children's Commissioner report. And I think the Children's Commissioner has quite rightly emphasised as his central theme that we must take account of young people's rights when it comes to their, the contracts that they sign with the big uh, football clubs. I think that's the main concern, but it's also worth observing that perhaps uh, the, the clubs in many ways have not been very good in general at bringing on young people in terms of uh, realising their potential. Perhaps my own uh, club, uh, Hibs, is an exception to that. They've done very well in terms of bringing on young people. But I think to all, all the top clubs have to listen very carefully to what Chick Brody has been saying and the Children's Commissioner are saying about the rights of young people who sign up for them particularly the right to have control, the right to be able to leave when they want to. I think that's one of the Commissioner's recommendations, that young people should be able to leave uh, giving 28 days' notice. And it's particularly appalling that when, when, when young footballers are 15, some of them are actually stuck with that particular club and can't move to another club and can't play for the university, as Chick Brody referred to. So there are big issues there that Chick Brody has highlighted, and, and we've had quite a lot of publicity around that over the weekend from the papers and from the Commissioner's report. So I hope some of 
momentum will build up around that central theme of this debate. But as I said, I want to consider also football for a much wider range of young people, boys and girls, and use two examples from my constituency because I'm lucky to have two outstanding examples in my constituency. And if I can start with Leith Athletic, which involves, I think, round about a couple of hundred young people in teams of varying ages from the early years of primary right up beyond school leaving age. And in particular, I want to congratulate the under-21 team, uh, which won, in fact, their third trophy in a matter of a, a few weeks uh, on uh, Saturday. And that, that's a, a splendid example of a large number of people in a local area being supported by a youth uh, football club. And the main point I would make about that is they do a great job, but they really do need more financial support. And I think there are big challenges for the SFA in that. Are they really going to support uh, uh, youth football and perhaps challenges uh, for the government uh, as well? The other example I want to give is the Spartan Community Football Academy, which is a social uh, enterprise uh, based uh, in my uh, constituent uh, in, uh, at Ainsley Park in the, in the Pilton area, and it's the charitable arm of the highly successful Spartans uh, Football Club. If you look at their website at the top, it says live together, play together, uh, win together. There's a massive number of young people uh, given an opportunity to participate in football there, and they can stay there for several uh, years. But I think that uh, those first two words, live together, emphasizes the wider aims that they have because they want to strengthen community cohesion in, in, involving, for example, uh, specific initiatives for ethnic minorities, and they also want to have a positive impact uh, on social targets such as health inequalities, increased employment opportunities, and crime reduction. They've been an outstanding uh, example of youth football for the many. But in my last minute, I must talk about girls and women. Girls are involved, for example, at Spartan, and we need to do a great deal more to encourage girls uh, uh, to have opportunities in football. One important initiative is that the Scottish um, Football Association joined UEFA's Women's Football Development Programme, a project uh, to, prom the, to, 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 pr on, to promote role models and ambassadors as a way of encouraging girls to uh, be involved in football. Specifically, members of the Scottish women's national team were selected as ambassadors to raise the profile uh, and support uh, the women's uh, and girls' game. The, the, these players uh, attended workshops and then went on school visits uh, and, and, and gra grassroots festivals that had been arranged for them. So that's really one example uh, to, of how to increase participation uh, in girls and women's football in Scotland at all levels. But we need a lot more initiatives. Girls must not be deprived of this opportunity. I know more play than did in the past, but there's a lot more to do there, and we shouldn't forget that aspect of this topic. Thank you. I now call Kenny McCaskill to be followed by Cameron Buchanan. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I should declare an interest as the Chairperson of Hibernian Supporters Limited, a company established for the ultimate fan ownership of Hibernian FC by uh, their fans. Uh, I would thank uh, Chick Brodie for bringing this debate. I think it is opportune, but I do believe uh, that the glass is uh, half full, not half empty. And although there are issues troubling Scottish football, uh, the game remains strong, certainly at grassroots, and that's what we require uh, to support. I do think it's important that, as along with Malcolm Chisholm, we should thank all those uh, who do such sterling services in each and every one of our uh, communities and constituencies. Uh, the game is built upon its grassroots. That is where the foundations remain, uh, and the clubs and the individuals who give a great deal of commitment. It's not easy being involved in grassroots football, whether for young people, whether for women. It takes out a lot of time that can come out of your family life, that can come out of your working life. It can cost you significant amount of money. Uh, the inconvenience that you may have to go through, understandably, for various checks and disclosures, all of which people have to surmount uh, to be able to do what we all appreciate and welcome in terms of their commitment. It's not an either-or, though, between the grassroots game and the pinnacle of the professional game. They are both dependent upon each other, and they require to show mutual respect and to work together. Earlier this afternoon, I was indeed down at Easter Road with two new signings for Hibernian, a 22-year-old and a 24-year-old. One of them has now moved to a full-time contract. This may be the pinnacle of his career. It may not. He may go on to even greater heights than playing, at the, uh, uh, playing for Hibs at Easter Road. But this is, as I say, a momentous moment for him. And it's something that he's probably dreamed for as a youngster, as many do. Very few have the opportunity, though, like him and his colleague, to actually make that progress. 
but it is in many instances what drives them, as indeed people all over the world will tune in on Saturday evening for the Champions League final. I enjoy the grassroots game, but equally I also enjoy supporting the very elite level. Scotland and Scottish football have had its difficulties, but there are uh, good things happening. The national team under Gordon Strachan is doing remarkably well, and hopefully not simply in the friendly, despite the controversy, but more importantly, next week in the uh, fixture that really matters for qualification, we will see success. Equally, I think what we also have to recognise is the importance that football has. It can provide opportunities both for youngsters and indeed for women. It can provide opportunities for those with learning difficulties, for those with educational difficulties, those who are offending. All of these people can be transformed by the power of football. And I do believe, as I say, that is based upon what the SFA and indeed the clubs can provide and support, but more importantly, the base in the communities that provides it. We have seen progress. The growth in the women's game is huge and significant and is to be very much welcomed. In youth football, we've seen a change, and I think it is for the benefit. We have perhaps seen less clubs but more teams. In Scotland, for too, all, too long, we perhaps had uh, too many people involved with clubs because of their own uh, youngster, and that's admirable and appropriate. But equally, we have to look to the continent, where clubs have not only hundreds of youngsters, but thousands of youngsters. They are a proper pyramid establishment, an elite perhaps even, and often with a professional club at the top. That's the direction that we have to go. We have to support the professional game. It's not, as I say, at the consequence uh, of the grassroots. It's how they work better and best together. That does require mutual respect, but given that, the game will flourish and go on to the success that we know it can and will have. Many thanks. I now call Cameron Buchanan to be followed by John Pentland. Thank you, Presiding Officer. F football is not excuse me, sorry, football is not just our national game, it's our national obsession. Since the early days, boys and girls now have grown up wanting to wear the dark blue jersey at Hamden. Football has the power to cross barriers and getting it right at a young age can help break down old age prejudices, prejudices in class, gender, race and religion. Youth football is not just about nurturing the next generation of professionals, it also helps youngsters learn transferable skills that can be used in everyday life, like teamwork, dedication and hard work. Ensuring that we have enough coaches who are sufficiently skilled to teach our kids the right footballing and life lessons is very important. Historically, Scotland has always been on top of the game when it comes to coaching. Largs on the West Coast is home to the prestigious SFA-run Elite Coaching Centre, where many of the game's greats earned their stripes, including the special one, and no, I'm not referring to you, Chick, but to Josie Mourinho. Despite this, the past two decades have been declined, seen declining standards, sadly, in our national game. The McLeish Report sought to provide a pathway back to the top table, and youth football was placed at the centre of this ambition. This report called for a minimum of 20 football academies and an increase, to, increase in participation to half a million. Therefore, the creation of a national academy based in Edinburgh is to be welcomed. A place where youngsters can come and learn from the best, both on and off the pitch, will hopefully develop the next generation of Dalgleishes and Laws. But more needs to be done. The Scottish FA commenced the Performance Schools Project in August 2012, which is designed for elite boys and girls and runs from S1 to S4. In Edinburgh, the programme is located at Broughton High School, where participates, uh, participants undertake their football education within the standard school curriculum. The beauty of this programme is its marriage between football skills and academic qualifications. Now, not everyone turns professional, and having a solid education is just as important as having a thunderous right boot. I would also like to reserve a special mention for Spartans, as did Football Club, as did Malcolm Chisholm, who have created an almost professional setup with both the age grade and senior teams. Spartans is now a model of diversity, housing both their senior men's, juniors and women's team under the same roof, which I think is very important. The partnership between the club and Edinburgh Leisure has shown what can be achieved with public and private cooperation. I have always believed that if clubs set aside rivalries, we can have a far more integrated youth coaching setup, particularly in relation to provincial clubs. Across the water in Fife, we have a regional academy which draws together four professional teams who provide coaching until the age of 16. Upon graduation, players have the choice of four different clubs to sign for. 
I believe if anyone in this chamber can help clubs set aside rivalries, it's Chick Brody, who, a man who has swapped sides more times than Mo Johnson. Changing a system is never easy. There have been bumps along the road. The Dutch coach, Mark Wotty, who was appointed to oversee the reforms of the McLeish report, recently left the SFA, citing that some people in Scotland are reluctant to change. This, I think, is disappointing, as we need more men like him. More men like Ian Cathro, who set up the Youth Football Academy in, I think it was Dundee, which helped to produce a string of technically gifted players at Tannadice. Players like Ryan Gold, who now plays for Sporting Lisbon in Portugal. Ian's talent took him to Portugal and now Spain, where he's assistant manager at Valencia. Success stories like this should be championed, but we should also, be dis I think, be disappointed that we've not retained talent like this in Scotland. In conclusion, youth football in Scotland has never been run so professionally. We have more coaches and volunteers than ever before. There's still a long way to go before we can match our continental competitors, but I think we are on the right track. The growth and success of the women's game should serve as a template and inspiration. I would urge the SFA and Scottish Government to continue to collaborate to ensure that every youngster has the opportunity to learn life skills associated with playing football. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call John Pentland to be followed by Graeme Day. Thank you, President Officer. I, I am speaking in my capacity as convener of the Public Petitions Committee and like others, can I thank Jack Brodie for bringing this motion to the Chamber for debate. Now, having been lodged in 2010, the public petition by William Scott and Scott Robertson has the dubious distinction of being one of the oldest still in the committee books, and uh, we are still considering three interlinked issues, contracts or registration agreements with professional clubs, young elite players being able to play for school teams, and the system of compensation payments between clubs for the transfer of young players under the age of 16 years. Children up to 14 can register with a club for a maximum of one season, registration lapsing at the end of each season. Thereafter, registration carried forward from 15 to 16 and from 16 to 17 so that a 15-year-old player can be kept for a further two years. In 2010, the committee took evidence from the Scottish Premier League, the Scottish Football Association, the Commissioner for Children and Young People, Rangers Director of Youth Development and the heads of two club youth academies. Now, while the SFA is primarily responsible for the operation of the sport, it is right that this Parliament and the Scottish Government ask questions as to how appropriate and fair the arrangements are. Football's governing bodies told us that the concern arose from misunderstandings and that change was not required. On the other hand, the petitioners, some young players and their parents and the children's commissioners feel that the arrangements restrict young players' freedoms and acts in the interest of the clubs, not the young players. The SFA say that FIFA requires national football associations to have a system to place reward to, place to reward young players. But are our systems fair? Now, since 2010, some changes have been made. Some young elite players can now play for their school teams, but those who train several times a week can play matches at the weekend. Is that restriction fair? A new system of transfer compensation payments has been introduced. It prescribes that payments to be made ranging from £600 to £15,000 depending on the club's contribution to the Club Academy Scotland programme. However, despite the changes, there are still concerns. In June last year, the Public Petitions Committee asked the Children's Commissioner to review the registration process and report its findings back to us. We recently received his report. It makes very interesting reading, and I welcome his recommendations, which include young players' rights must be respected when entering into what is, in effect, a contract. Current arrangements create an imbalance of power. Registration for older youth players should not carry over from the end of a season, and young players should not be, be prevented from playing football because professional clubs are negotiating trade deals. The registration process needs to be independently monitored, and there should be clear complaints. A, a, there should be a clear complaints mechanism. And the point that I agree with wholeheartedly is that clubs must take a greater account of young people's rights. They should respect all their needs, not just treating them as footballing assets or worse, as monetary investments. So, in conclusion, President Officer, the, the committee will take evidence from the commissioner on his findings before the summer recess 
and I commend his report to the Chamber. Thank you very much. And I now call Graham Day to be followed by James Kelly. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The uh, registration slash contract situation pertaining to young footballers has been the subject of debate over many years, and in certain regards, where we find ourselves today is a considerable improvement on where once Scottish football was. I make that point not in any way to diminish the validity of debate in this matter. Indeed, can I congratulate Chick Brody for giving us this opportunity? I just want to bring a degree of context to things. I can go back the best part of 35 years to my early days as a sports journalist when certain clubs were signing up youngsters on lengthy pro contracts which involved extended options. What these did was bind rising talent to the teams for an initial, say, four-year term. term. Then, if the club wanted to hang on to them because they progressed to the point of becoming a playing or financial asset, the option was exercised and the contract was extended for perhaps another three years. There was, of course, no guarantee of that happening. Therefore, the option was a one-way benefit to the clubs and the player could be held on to regardless of whether he wanted that. Notwithstanding the problems which exist currently as regards the youth registration process, I think it is fair to say the Scottish game has become far better organised and more professional in its development of young players, which is to everyone's benefits. And let's acknowledge that a number of our major clubs, such as Aberdeen, the team that both Mark McDonald and I support, Dundee United, Hamilton and Hearts, are bringing through talented home reared players, which is to be very welcomed. But it's only right and proper that from a sport which can fulfil or destroy the dreams of young people in far less than equal measure, we demand the same standards of treatment of those young people as we do from other sectors of our society. And the Scottish Football Authorities really do, I would suggest, need to respond appropriately to the Commissioner's report, which is being considered, as we've heard, by the Public Petitions Committee. There are undoubtedly a number of the key recommendations contained within the report. They could, without undermining the structures which are delivering this emergence of young talent within the Premier League, deliver on. Let me pick out five key demands relating to the pre-formal contract phase of a young player's development. Recommendation three, professional youth football in Scotland needs to undergo a significant attitudinal change. The clubs, and to some extent the SFA, refer to youth players purely in terms of investment and fail to acknowledge the young person in their own right. Recommendation seven, rules are required on the formation, performance, enforcement and impact of contracts. Rights and remedies must be accessible, relevant, independent and effective for children and young people. Number 11, steps must be taken to avoid situations where a child or young person is prevented from playing football for an entire season, whilst professional clubs negotiate trade deals. Uh, recommendation 12, the youth registration process is an agreement between two parties that places obligations on both to ensure it takes, takes account of the interests and rights of children and young people as much as the interests of professional football clubs. It needs to be regulated and monitored in a manner that is independent of the clubs. And finally, regardless of whether or not an independent regulatory body is established, a clear process needs to be put in place immediately to ensure that the children and young people can lodge a complaint where they feel their rights have been infringed by a club. These are not unreasonable expectations in this day and age, presiding officer. We cannot continue to have a situation where, as the Commissioner says in the overview, it is reasonable to conclude that the terms of the contracts are not necessarily mutually agreed, as they are not adequately understood, where the process of cancelling or renewing a young person's registration would, as the report asserts, appear to be skewed in favour of the best interests of the professional club, and that from the age of 10, children are effectively making a decision which ties them to one professional team for the duration of their youth football years, unless another side steps in and reimburses training course. And surely no one would deny the appropriateness of ensuring that each young person registering to play with a pro club is provided with age-appropriate guidance on that from what that registration actually means in advance of signing and that age-appropriate versions of codes of conduct are developed. Some will balk at some of what is being proposed. They will predict implementation of these measures will put clubs off bringing through youngsters and undermine the whole development process. I'm not sure quite why that would be the case. The better that young players are treated, surely the more likely it is they will choose to remain with the club they are linked to, and the club will inevitably get far more out of a contented player than one being forcibly held on to. In other words, everyone wins. Many thanks. I now call James Kelly to be followed by Mark MacDonald. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I first of all congratulate Chick Brodie on securing the debate tonight focusing on the, the issue of uh, youth football. There's no doubt that uh, when you listen to all the members speaking, and, and I've, I very much align myself with that, football is a big part uh, of our lives, a big part of our upbringing. And I think it's also really important in our, in our constituencies, uh, a lot of communities that we represent, uh, football currently plays a big part there. And 
historically has also made a, a major contribution. So I want to start by just noting some of the, the local successes in relation to my constituency and, and start by highlighting the, the excellent work of the Blantyre Soccer Academy, which has uh, been chaired uh, and organised by uh, local Jimmy Whelan. Uh, this is an excellent club which has got, uh, supports many in the community uh, across boys and girls. And the highlight for this club each year is the Raymond uh, Gormley uh, Memorial uh, Football Tournament. This is in celebration of uh, young Raymond Gormley who tragically lost his life in a, in a stabbing in 2011. But this tournament not only allows a lot of young teams in Lanarkshire to come together, uh, but also raises money uh, for charity and also helps support the, the Gormley fam family. Um, so I think that's, that's something to, to celebrate. Uh, I also uh, very much welcome the growth in women and girls uh, football in recent years. In fact, there are two youngsters in my constituency, Moran uh, Cunningham from Stonelaw High and Brogan Hay from Trinity High, who are part of the Scotland under-15s uh, uh, girls team. And I think they're very much to be commended on their success. I also think that Football can be used, you know, positively. Uh, you see, now by mouth, I've got some excellent schemes where they use football as a method of tackling sectarian, sectarianism to bring down uh, barriers, you know, that exist between communities. And they use football as a, a vehicle for dealing with that. And I think that's very much, you very much want to commend the work of Dave Scott and his team uh, in doing so. I think in relation to tonight's debate, although we want to celebrate youth football and, you know, be positive, uh, as Kenny McCaskill was, about, uh, you know, current, the current state of play in, in Scottish football, I think Chick Brodie does raise some very important issues about how uh, young people are treated. I think when you have people tied into contracts and they're not able to play as freely as they would like to play, uh, as uh, John Pentland pointed out, that, that is all, not only unfair, but it's an infringement of uh, young people's rights. And I also think it is totally un unacceptable if we get a situation where uh, clubs are paying youngsters less than the minimum wage. I think, as Chick Brodie said, it is incumbent not only on the clubs, but on the football authorities, the SFA and the SPFL, uh, to take responsibility in this area and to ensure that that does not happen. Uh, we can't have it happen. And I think we've got a, a, an opportunity with the Petitions Committee uh, examining the Commissioner's report uh, to, uh, that gives us a platform not only to examine these issues, but also to ensure that we can hold the clubs and the football organisations to account. And that gives us an opportunity in terms of tonight's debate, not only to success, sorry, to celebrate the success of youth football, but to make sure that the arrangements around taking good care of our youngsters are robust going into the future. Many thanks. And uh, final open debate speaker, Mark McDonald, please. Thank, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And I stand as somebody who has uh, both been a youth football player and also a youth football coach. Uh, having uh, coached uh, the under-13s team at Dice Boys Club uh, back in the uh, before I became uh, elected, um, both Dice Boys Club and Albion Boys Club, who are the two cl youth clubs in Aberdeen who tend to uh, compete for honours alongside uh, Lewis United Youth, um, are based in my constituency. And Lewis United Youth are an interesting club because they are actually uh, established. Uh, as a result of players being released from the Aberdeen FC under-12 development squad um, and have since grown to become a much larger club with teams at all age groups. But DICE was the club that I uh, w coached with and uh, the past players who have come through that uh, system include uh, Graham Shinney, who lifted the Scottish Cup for Cali Thistle at the weekend, and his brother Andrew, who plays for Birmingham, uh, the recently retired Aberdeen captain Russell Anderson, uh, and Stuart Armstrong, who recently signed for Celtic from Dundee United. So many clubs can point to uh, players plying their trade professionally as players who have come through their system. Uh, many can also uh, attest to the ones who got away as well and who perhaps came through a different route. 
But I think the, the, the point is, is prescient around uh, expectation uh, amongst young players. And certainly I remember um, uh, when my brother played youth football, he was a contemporary of Sean Maloney, uh, who, who played for one of the uh, competitor clubs that he, he played against. Uh, that there were players who my brother uh, played for the Aberdeen uh, squad with that went to the Jack Wood tournament in Wales who uh, were training with uh, professional clubs because at that time those clubs didn't have their own age group specific teams per se. Uh, they would take players who were with, attached with other clubs to train with them and would then decide who they would sign up onto forms uh, at a later stage. But now clubs have uh, development squads at all age groups uh, consisting of a large number of, uh, of boys. And I think uh, Chick Brody makes the point that uh, for many of these youngsters, um, they, they perhaps don't realise at the point at which they sign for the clubs just how few people can make it in the game uh, and I think perhaps we need to do more to ensure that that realisation and those expectation levels are managed both for the players themselves and also for their parents. I think there's a question about how we develop uh, young players in Scotland. One of the things I'm very passionate about is summer football. Uh, having uh, coached uh, at youth level, one of the most frustrating things is trying to uh, encourage uh, passing football, trying to encourage uh, the skills that you teach in the gym hall uh, or the, the training area uh, and try and put that into practice on the pitch uh, and trying to do that in some of the weather conditions that we experience in Scotland in January and February when it becomes uh, much more difficult for young players in particular to, um, to, to hone those skills and you end up developing the kick and rush football uh, because uh, in driving rain and gale force winds sometimes that's all that, that you're, you're faced with. Uh, I think also in terms of development of young players how uh, clubs interact, uh, I mean the professional clubs, interact with those what we call the feeder clubs or the established youth clubs when players are being released so that they're not left to uh, try and go and find a club when at a point at which they will obviously be quite upset at the fact that they're no longer going to be continued within the system of a professional club. That I think needs to be looked at as well. And one final point, if I may, presiding officer, is around loss of municipal pitches, uh, which I think is an issue that, that we need to look at very carefully. In, in my own constituency, the uh, Aberdeen Lads Club pitches are about to be developed upon. That will result in the loss of a number of grass pitches, which are to be replaced by one 3G pitch, not within that community, but elsewhere within the city. That will be a benefit to the community of Northfield, who are set to get that 3G pitch. And while 3G pitches can be used more than grass pitches because of the, the quality of the surface, I do think we need to look very carefully at how municipal pitches are being protected and also how the upkeep of those pitches is being protected as well to ensure that when our young uh, developing players go out and play on these pitches, they are able to play the game the way that we would expect the game to be played and can develop their skills from there. Thank you very much. Uh, can I now invite the Minister, Jamie Hepburn, to respond to the debate. Minister, seven minutes or so. Thank you very much, uh, President Officer. And can I thank uh, all members for taking part in the debate? I'd particularly like to thank Chick Brodie for securing uh, the debate so that Parliament can consider the benefits that youth football can bring uh, across the country. I know Mr Brodie has a keen interest in football. I know that he was a very good footballer in his youth. I primarily know that, President Officer, because Mr Brodie tells me and assures me that it was the case, but I do know that he is a survivor of the uh, junior leagues uh, in Dundee, uh, making my own uh, modest achievements in football uh, pale uh, by comparison. Uh, President officer, uh, in a week, I think we can all accept that football has had its difficulties uh, internationally. I think this debate can uh, serve as a reminder of what is good uh, about the game uh, and what is good about the sport of football, about opportunities for youngsters to take part in something uh, they love. Young people, both uh, girls and boys taking part in football are the lifeblood of the game, so we must do all we can to encourage them so they can flourish and make the most of their talents and hopefully uh, if, uh, they get the opportunity to have uh, successful uh, careers. Mr Brodie has raised legitimate concerns about the processes of registration of players uh, with professional clubs, and I will uh, come to that in due course, but I think it is important uh, to also, first of all, recognise that most uh, youth football is delivered at the uh, amateur level, only a very small proportion will be delivered through uh, Scotland's professional clubs. And that means there are thousands 
of volunteers across the country, mums and dads, dedicated uh, coaches uh, devoting their time to support the youngsters to have uh, the opportunity to uh, take part in youth uh, football. Uh, and of course, all members will have uh, many examples of such uh, youth clubs in uh, their uh, area. And James Kelly uh, reminded us of uh, the importance of uh, football uh, to, uh, to communities across uh, Scotland. I think it is appropriate at this uh, juncture to uh, pay, put on record uh, my thanks. I'm sure all members' thanks for uh, the efforts of those uh, volunteers involved in amateur youth uh, football. Many members gave examples of good work in their area. Uh, Mr Kelly uh, gave a very specific example of how powerful football can be as a positive example of uh, community cohesion with uh, the uh, example of the tournament held to honour the memory of uh, Raymond Gormley. I would like to thank him for uh, bringing that example uh, to uh, the Chamber. Malcolm Chisholm uh, made the point that we must do uh, more to support girls uh, into uh, football. I quite agree uh, with that perspective. I think, uh, frankly, it is a, a point that could be uh, made more generally uh, about sport. I am sure Malcolm Chisholm would agree. I had the opportunity to attend the Scottish Women of course, yes. Matt McDonald. I, I am aware that uh, through the uh, establishment of the quality mark that clubs which were specifically uh, only orientated towards boys' football are now branching out to include girls' teams and girls' training sessions, which allows, I think, more girls to get involved in football at the grassroots. So the quality mark, I think, has been a very welcome addition. Minister. Yes, I would uh, very much uh, recognise that in my own area we have a very good example of a, a club that uh, has gone through uh, that process, the Cumbernauld Colts, which uh, offer opportunities right across the age ranges to some 500-plus uh, youngsters, uh, including uh, uh, girls, and they have achieved that standard. Indeed, uh, I could uh, let the Chamber know that uh, I was very delighted to learn that not only do they have that status, they have just been accepted to full membership of uh, the Scottish Football Association, which is a great uh, recognition of the effort uh, they make uh, locally. I suppose I am allowed to make a, a specific uh, local example as well in these debates. Uh, President officer, I hope you will uh, allow me uh, to do so. Uh, returning to the issue uh, of uh, the uh, role of uh, girls in football and sport more generally, I was uh, very privileged to attend the Scottish Women's Sport Conference uh, last week. These uh, were issues that were being uh, taken up uh, there. And, uh, of course, the Scottish Government commissioned uh, the working group uh, on women in sport, which was chaired by Baroness Sue Campbell and Sports Scotland are now taking forward the work of uh, that group uh, through their own equality subgroup, which will ultimately report uh, to their board. But I very much recognise we have to do more to promote uh, positive role models for girls. And, of course, uh, such examples do exist. Uh, President Officer Chick Brody has uh, raised uh, concerns, and, uh, again, I, will, I promise him I will turn my attention to those uh, concerns in a second, but he's raised concerns about the role of elite clubs. But I can think of a very positive example uh, from one of Scotland's elite clubs at uh, Glasgow City uh, Football Club, the best uh, women's team in the country. Indeed, they were the last Scottish club uh, 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 left in Europe uh, in the season. It uh, just passed. They got the furthest of any of the clubs competing in Europe. And I was very uh, delighted to meet uh, Laura Montgomery, who is a founder, co-founder and director of Glasgow City. And I was very uh, struck uh, by that uh, club's determination to support uh, young girls into football and also providing uh, the positive role models through the players they have uh, playing for their uh, first team. President, President Officer, let me turn my attention to uh, the specific points raised uh, on uh, youth football contracts and uh, registration issues by uh, Chick Brody. I know that the uh, Public, Petitions, uh, Public Petitions Committee has been working uh, on this issue since uh, 2010 when the petition uh, was lodged with it. I know that uh, Chick Brody has taken uh, a close interest in it. The committee, uh, of course, requested that comprehensive review to be undertaken by the Scottish Commissioner for Children and Young People on the current registration process, particularly uh, from a rights perspective. Mr Brodie referred to that, and indeed the convener of the committee uh, mentioned that. I am very pleased to see uh, that review has been uh, completed and has been uh, begun to be considered uh, by the committee as a, a thorough and substantial uh, report that incorporates a child's rights uh, impact assessment, explores the views of young players and has a, a wide range of recommendations for those involved in youthful football, uh, particularly uh, the uh, clubs and the SFA uh, to consider. I, I would suggest it is a bit premature for me to comment in uh, too much detail in relation to that report. I know that the uh, committee still has a job of work to do, so I look forward to uh, the conveners confirmed that they are going to take evidence from the Commission. I look forward to seeing uh, the results from that and seeing where the, commission, the committee takes its uh, petition. But I can say I have seen some of the coverage uh, generated by Mr Brodie's contact with the press over the weekend. Mr Brodie, Brodie uh, alluded to the example 
of the young man who is unable to uh, play for his university team or an amateur, uh, an amateur uh, level because the professional club which holds his registration refuses to release him from that. Uh, that quite clearly it seems unfair and unreasonable. I can also inform Mr Brodie I have sought uh, a meeting with uh, the Children and Young Pe uh, People's Commissioner to discuss his uh, report. I am also very happy uh, to meet with Mr Brodie uh, directly to discuss his concerns and perspective on this uh, matter. Let me conclude, uh, President Officer. I, I recognise the uh, legitimate concerns that Mr Brodie uh, has raised, but we should also recognise the vast good that is out there in youth football across Scotland. So can I thank uh, Chick Brodie for securing tonight's debate to give us the opportunity to have done just that. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Minister. And that concludes Chick Brodie's debate on youth football's contribution to men's and women's football. And I now close this meeting of Parliament.